Hello everyone, this is Shannon from That's So Po, and today I am doing the Bougie Booktuber tag. Uh, this tag was created by Olive from a book Olive, and she also tagged me, which is interesting because I didn't know that Olive knew about my channel. In any case, I am pretty excited to do this tag because it actually made me think of so many different things. Um, this tag really asks you to consider your relationship with the value of of books and how you spend money on books and what you find important about that kind of money value relationship uh, and I had so many thoughts so as I go through my answers you will see question one what is your average monthly budget for books so I don't have a budget specifically for books I do have a personal budget that I try to stay within for each week and this covers everything from, you know, getting coffee out at a coffee shop to buying a new pair of shoes to buying books. Um, I don't really track books separately, so I don't really know how much I spend. But I think on the order of zero to twenty five dollars a month is probably correct. I, in general, try to mainly borrow my books from the library. And when I buy a book, it has to be for a very specific reason. Um, generally, I don't buy books that I haven't read yet unless I think that they are something that both Sush and I really really want to read and it's easier if we just own a copy or if I have already read a book and I absolutely love it and want to add it to our collection or if I'm getting it as a gift for Sush um, but in general I don't really buy very many books uh, and one of the reasons that that is is because I used to buy a lot of books so for a very long time I would buy tons of books and I would read them but then my collection just got really really big and I would just buy you know mass market paperbacks because I was reading mainly romance and fantasy and I realized that one I was running out of room two I didn't really care about the books that I owned they were just things that I bought so that I could read and then I just hung on to them and then three I also realized that I had entered a bit of a reading slump because it felt like too much of going out on a limb to buy a new book that I didn't know if it would be good or not. So I kind of bought less and bought fewer authors that I didn't already know, which meant I just wasn't reading widely enough. And that meant that I just wasn't reading as much. So that has gotten a lot better in the past few years. One of the things that I've done is we moved a couple of times and each time we moved, I culled my book collection and really got rid of things that I didn't you know care about so much and I read a few years ago um, Marie Kondo's The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up and that was really good it really helps you think why do I value the books that I keep um, and if I'm thinking, oh, I should keep this book because it, you know, I might reread it someday. That's not the same thing as I'm keeping this book because its presence in my house brings me happiness. So I've tried to kind of follow that and try to just borrow as much as I can from the library and really only allow books in my house that are there because they bring me joy. Question two, what's the most you've ever spent in a bookstore? So in general, I don't go into bookstores very often. And even though I used to go quite a lot, I would you know pick up one or two books here and there. So I don't have a great answer for this as a physical bookstore buy, but recently I spent a lot of money buying books from an online bookstore. So I bought Sush for his 40th birthday, the um, entire up to now cloth bound collection of the Discworld books from Discworld Emporium, which I will link below. This was very expensive because one, uh, it's a lot of books, two, they're cloth bound, and three, shipping from the UK to the US is quite expensive. So I think that the entire thing altogether was something like $700, which is quite a lot. Question three, are you willing to pay full price for a brand new release or will you wait until you have a coupon or there's a sale? I'm definitely happy to pay full price for any book that I buy. Um, I don't really want to wait on a sale. And if I want a book, it's not that often that I buy a book, so I'll just pay full price. However, I have been tempted to purchase something I wouldn't otherwise have purchased because there's a sale. So for example, recently, A Memory Called Empire was on sale on Kindle for like $3. 
And this was something that I knew both Sush and I wanted to read, so I did pick it up, whereas normally I probably would have just borrowed that from the library. Question four, would you rather buy one new book or several less expensive used copies? In general, I would rather buy no books and just borrow unlimited books from the library. However, if I'm gonna buy something, I'm gonna buy it new. Because if I'm buying it, I'm buying it to have as part of a collection at home of books that I absolutely love and I wanna keep forever. So used books really don't um, work for me and anything that I would buy it used, I would just get at the library and return it instead. Question five, what do you think is a reasonable price for a new hardback book, a paperback, an ebook? I don't generally pay too much attention to the prices of books, so I don't know that I have a very firm understanding of what a reasonable price is. I think I would notice if these books were priced um, extremely high or extremely low. I think that as long as a hardback is somewhere between 10 and $40, I probably wouldn't think that it was an absurd price. Um, for a paperback, I would expect less, maybe somewhere between five and 15. And eBooks, I expect to be priced pretty similarly to paperbacks, except that sometimes they go on like really extreme sales. So I probably wouldn't notice if it were on sale for extremely low, other than to think, mm, maybe I wanna pick that up. Uh, however, speaking of what is a reasonable price, for these really made me think a lot about ebooks. So I do the majority of my reading, maybe like 90% of my reading on my phone. Um, I'm one of those people. I find it super convenient to read on my phone. I like to read in the bath. I like to read in bed. I like to read when I'm out and about if I just have a moment where I'm not doing anything and my phone is the most convenient format. So I read almost everything either through my Libby library app or through the Kindle app. So most of my reading is through ebook. However, ebooks have a lot of issues that have really been making me consider if this is the way that I want to read going forward because of all of these issues. So the first issue with ebooks is DRMs. So digital rights management is sort of like a limitation on the software file of any ebook that you have. What this means is that when you buy an ebook, your rights to that ebook are kind of limited. You can't lend that out to a friend. You can't resell it. You can't um, give it away. So your rights to that ebook are sort of limited. Additionally, if anything were to happen to the company that you bought that ebook from, like if that company decided to change their policies and say, oh, you can't access anything um, that is more than five years old, or if they went out of business, you would no longer have access to that ebook. Um, I've linked below an article talking about some of those issues with DRMs. But what this means is that when you buy an ebook, you're really just buying access to it. You're not buying ownership of that book, which has very much led me and Sush to decide that if there's any books that we truly, truly love, we buy a physical copy um, to keep in our house just for that permanency and so that we always do have access to it as well as to support the author um, of books that we really like. The second issue with ebooks is that the pricing of them for libraries is pretty ridiculous. I don't know if you guys have heard about this in the news, but um, recently publishers have been making a lot of very difficult rules for libraries. So the state of how things are is that libraries already pay much more for ebooks than regular users, so they might have to pay about 30 to $60 per copy. Um, they can't lend an ebook out to multiple people at a time. It's only one patron at a time. Uh, and often these $60 copies will expire after two years. So they're just buying the rights for two years for $60 for a book. Additionally, recently, Macmillan, who is the publisher that has the Tor imprint, um, decided that they wanted to make it even harder for libraries and they created an embargo on new books, meaning that each library system, when a new book came, comes out, they can get one copy of the book for the first eight weeks. After that, they can buy more copies, but for the first eight weeks, they can only buy one copy. And this is completely ignoring the size 
of the library system. So my library system, for example, serves a population of 1.4 million people. So that means that for 1.4 million people, they can buy one copy of any new ebook. And that is just ridiculous. A lot of the libraries have been speaking out about this. The Association of Librarians of America has come out against this. Um, and they're just very much like, you guys, you're making it so difficult for people to access um, ebooks. And the stated reason by Macmillan is, well, but people are just borrowing the books rather than purchasing them. So it's hurting our sales. So it's like they're questioning the very uh, purpose of libraries. So I, I will link an article about that below as well. But that sort of greed on the part of publishers, that sort of um, access issues with eBooks makes me really question if even though this is the way that it's easiest for me to read, if I want to support these sorts of practices in the industry. So I've been trying to be a little bit better about borrowing physical books as well from my library. It's just that it's harder for me to read them. Question six, is a signed book worth more to you? How about a first edition? This is a really interesting question because this is bringing up the idea of what exactly we're valuing. Um, if we value a signed copy or a specific edition more, then we're not just valuing the words on the page, we're valuing something bigger than that. And this really relates to um, a book that I recently read, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, which questions sort of how we assign value to things, what we believe has value, what we kind of buy into. It also brings up the idea in the art world of how we determine the value of art and authenticity and things like that. So I've linked some articles about that below, but it's this idea that we care a lot, not just about the beauty of something or its inherent artistic value, but we also care about its history, its connection to important things or important uh, people. We care about when it was made, who made it. So we care about all of these things that are very, in a sense, tangential to the actual object. And that can mean that, you know, having something that was uh, a book that was owned by a particular person can make it more valuable. In any case, um, I don't really buy into a lot of that. <laughs> um, for me, I think that a signed book could potentially have more value simply because if I went to a signing and I met the author and they signed it, then that's a memory. And so recalling that memory can make that more special to me. But I wouldn't really be as interested in just buying a book that had a signature already in it. That wouldn't appeal to me. I wouldn't pay more money for that. And I don't think that I would pay more money for a specific edition either. I think that in general, maybe I'm really self-centered when it comes to value, but if it has some sort of memory attached for me, I care. But if it's some sort of bigger historical, social, cultural thing, eh, I, I don't think I value it that much. Question seven, what is your most valuable book, sentimental or actual value? I think for me, this would probably be my Teddy Roosevelt biography trilogy uh, by Edmund Morris that Sush gave me as a gift. Um, this was a trilogy that I read and absolutely loved. I'm a huge fan of Teddy Roosevelt, and this is just probably like some of the best nonfiction I've ever read. And Sush gave it to me, which makes it a really, you know, special thing as well. And it just looks great. It has kind of pride of place in my little book shrine. Um, so this is probably the one that is most valuable to me. Question eight, will you pay more for a cover or edition you like better? The answer to this is definitely yes. Um, again, if I buy a physical book, I'm buying it to collect it. And therefore I kind of care how it looks. Um, for example, I had some old beat up copies of the wheel of time from when I'd read it originally as mass market paperbacks and like a couple of hardcovers from when it was coming out when I was in high school. And I replaced those, um, a couple of years ago when I bought the entire series anew with very pretty new covers so that we had a nice matching set as a gift for Sush slash myself. Um, and definitely I went out of my way to find the covers that I liked for that. Question nine, what physical characteristics does a good quality book have? 
I don't think that I pay all that much attention to quality of books, although I think that I notice if something is a particularly poor quality. So for example, um, I, I mentioned those ratty copies of The Wheel of Time that I had. Those were mass market paperbacks. And because those books were so thick, like 800 pages, uh, and because I reread them so many times, all of the covers had separated from the actual book. Um, and I think that that's kind of poor quality. So uh, I guess for me, quality means the cover not coming off. Question 10. If you won the lottery, what bookish things would you do with the money? Okay, so I would not play the lottery. Um, playing the lottery is, in general, in my opinion, sort of a waste of money. Um, I'll link an article below that talks about the odds of winning the lottery. Additionally, even if I were to play the lottery, I would not want to win because often the people who win the lottery have really awful outcomes. The consequences of winning the lottery can be very, very severe. People have their entire lives sort of destroyed by it. Again, I will link an article below if you're curious about reading uh, about how some people have had their lives really ruined by having that much money all at once. So. I would not want to win the lottery. However, going with the spirit of the question, if I were independently wealthy in such a way that I had so much money that I could spend it however I wanted on bookish things, um, I think that the thing I might enjoy doing would be investing in small publishing houses and like independent authors. Um, I think that it would be really cool to use my money to influence um, kind of the representation and support that authors of less heard backgrounds get. So I think it would be really fun to, for example, um, hear more from indigenous authors or just authors who are underrepresented in other ways. I especially like the idea of hearing about different um, local cultures or histories or mythologies. So that would be really, really fun. I think that even without being independently wealthy, we can definitely, um, as booktubers, sort of support some of these small publishing houses and independent authors. I've seen, for example, in Jerry at Onyx Pages, she does a lot of this. She reads a ton of books that are from very small publishers. She talks about them. She does author interviews, all this sort of stuff to really uplift those voices. Also, I recently subscribed to Russell at Ink and Paper Blog. And um, in each of his videos, he reminds watchers that they should buy books from independent uh, booksellers, but also request that their library order copies of books. And that seems like a really great way to me, even if I don't want to go out and buy tons of books, to support a lot of these smaller presses and independent authors getting their books out there. Bonus, give us an image, actual or mental, of your dream home library. Like so many other people, I think my dream home library is that idea of a little reading nook. Um, I'll put a picture up of kind of the idea. I think that we have a window in our house where I think I could put a bench seat. So maybe someday I will create my own little reading nook, but that's probably my ideal. And finally, I would like to tag Paul at Paul Weymouth to do this bougie booktuber tag. Paul recently has a video, which I will link below, talking about his changing relationship with books and buying books. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear what he has to say about all of this. So Paul, if you're interested in doing this tag, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Also, if anybody else is interested in doing this tag, please, I tag you. I would love to hear what you have to say, what your relationship with buying books and valuing books is. It's a really cool topic and I would love to hear everybody talk about it.